Hey, it's Thursday, April 23rd. We're studying 2 Peter chapter 1. We've actually re reached the bottom of the chapter, but let's get some context here and remember that he's talking here about the Mount of Transfiguration, talking about the holy mountain where there was that uh, revelation of Christ showing his glory with Moses and Elijah. And he talks about the written word of God, though, being a more confident, a firmer testimony than him just saying he heard a, a voice on the mountain. Uh, the prophetic word, and we looked at that Greek phrase, and that's the emphasis in the text there. The prophetic word is a more sure and more confirmed, more uh, uh, solid word for us to, to trust in rather than someone's testimony. And you do well to pay attention to it. And of course, that is a real exclamation point on the whole of the first chapter, which has so much uh, exhortive material, horatory material, it's called, in the first chapter. And it's a lamp, that's what the Bible is often called, a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, looking forward to that coming day of Christ's arrival when we see him face to face. And then we saw this yesterday, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture, there's the idea, the prophetic word, the written word, comes from one's own interpretation. We're not just sitting here, or the leaders weren't sitting there, the prophets weren't sitting there trying to just give their best thoughts about God. Now here's our verse for today. For... Describing this, no prophecy, talking about Scripture here, talking about the prophetic word, no prophecy was ever produced and come about by the will of man, by people sitting down and deciding, today I'm going to write some Bible. But men spoke from God, and in this case, of course, we're talking about written Scripture, prophetic word. We're talking about the things that were actually written, but that's the idea of it putting it down. God communicates it. Uh, those men communicated from God as they were, this is a very important phrase here, carried along by the Holy Spirit, carried along by the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about this idea. First, we should probably deal with this word prophecy. I think we dealt with this last time, but the idea of prophecy, so often we think about a um, foretelling of future events, which is certainly the unique aspect of biblical prophecy. Uh, but there's so much of prophecy that is just, as we talked about that word nabi, that Old Testament word of a mouthpiece, it's just God communicating. And it's a, a a forth telling of God's truth to mankind. And the point is, this isn't people just sitting around coming up with, with ideas and messages to, to present to people. It's not the will of man that produces this. The, the prophecy was given, or the forth telling of God's revelation, by God. It's not the will of man, it's the will of God. It's not the words of man, ultimately, as we saw last time from First Thessalonians. It is the word of God. So let's look at a passage that we should always look at when we're talking about the nature of God's Word and I referenced it last time, but we didn't look at it here, and we I think we quote we quoted it without looking closely at it. So here's the verse that is so key, talking about written scripture. It is breathed out by God. That concept of being breathed out by God translates that one word theonoustos, which is the Greek word, the compound word for God and nuo, which uh, is to breathe, to breathe out. Uh, we have the word inspiration coming into English, all the way back to Tyndale's translation of the English, uh, which comes from a Latin word, which uh, inspiro is the word to breathe out in Latin. And that word inspiration is very common in most English translations until recently. And thankfully, uh, there are some translations that like to say it as literally as possible, like the ESV here, breathed out by God. So it's uh, not man's breath, not man's words, not man's communication. It's not the will of man. It's the will of God to put this message out, and it's breathed out by God, and therefore it is profitable for all the things that we do with it, for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness that we can be complete and equipped for every good work. So the concept of the Bible being breathed out by God is the distinction of the uh, will of man the product of man, the intention of man, the words of man, and the words of God. Notice here, and I kind of messed it up in terms of the, the red ink all over this, but Scripture uh, is in, inspired or the breathed out by God. If you use the old word inspired, it comes from the Latin word inspiro, which means breathed out. But if we say that, I just want to re remind you of what is inspired here. What is breathed out is the Scripture. All Scripture is inspired. All Scripture is breathed out by God. It's not the authors that are inspired, and it's not the readers that are inspired. At least that's not the statement being made here. It's the words, it's the writings that are breathed out, inspired. And I think some people use the word inspired to 
think about the the prophets having this uh, stroke of inspiration, this creative idea. They might even credit God with it. But the idea of the scripture here, as it's presented to us in this verse in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, is that it is God that is breathing out the product. So not the authors, that's not the object here, and it's not the reader, it's the actual text itself. God has breathed out this through the means of the prophets, which is what our passage is all about, the idea of men spoke from God. And how do we know it's from God? Well, we touched on this last time, but go to Peter's first epistle here. He says, concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours. This is a future looking. Uh, They searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person, verse 11, or time, like who was this Christ and and what time was he going to come, that the Spirit of Christ in them, so we're talking now about the Spirit in these prophets, that's who we're talking about, prophets, was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them they weren't serving themselves because they realized the time of it was not now, uh, but they were serving you. Things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you, and again, by the Holy Spirit, the preaching of the New Testament apostles sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. But the point of all of this that I'm trying to underscore in this text is that they are giving information in the Old Testament about the coming of the time and the person of Christ, which so much of what we read in the New Testament shows us that the Spirit of God in the Old Testament, the Spirit of Christ, he's called here, is giving them that look into the future. Therefore, they're writing things down about the future, which, again, is the unique thing about Scripture. As Isaiah 41 says, and we quoted a couple of these passages, we didn't quote this one, where God is taunting the, the, the worshipers of idols. Take a look at this in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 21. Set forth your case, case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, which is very important. As we saw that Francis Schaeffer quote, we don't want to just believe to believe or believe without asking questions. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. God wants us to have proof. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen, because that would be ultimate proof if we can tell the future. Tell us the former things, things that you weren't there to see, uh, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome. Now, what happens about those things in the future? Like the Davidic covenant that we're studying in our DBR. God makes a promise and he fulfills it in the ultimate son of David. Or declare to, declare to us, this is the real hard thing, the things to come. Who can do that but God? Tell us what is to come hereafter. Tell us that we may know that you are gods. I mean, if you have any power, there's the real power. If you're sovereign over all things, tell us the future. To do good or to do harm, that we might be dismayed and terrified. Right? We would fear your gods if they were real God, if they were God, and they're not God because they can't, as this passage says, they can't tell us what's to come. They can't tell us the things that are that are going to happen, what is to happen. Behold, you are nothing. This is what the Bible says about people worshiping powers that are not powers at all. Uh, your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he, and here's the real indictment, he who chooses you. Uh, You need to choose the real God and his communication because he's the one, as we see in this passage here, who can tell us what is to happen, the things that were to come. And because we have the span from 1445 BC all the way to the 90 AD, and we have that biblical history, we can see of the prophets prophesying things that were to come. And that gives us that assurance that this is God who has the ability to tell the future. Our passage here says that the, these men were, they spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, look at this text with me. Here's the same Greek word and the same concept which may help us think through what this means, this act of God's, um, we like to call it, at least in theology, the old word, inspiration, the act of inspiration, God's inspiration of Scripture. How does that work? Well, in this text, our text, that says they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, which is a key phrase. And we get it twice in this passage. And speaking here about uh, maritime issues, uh, things on uh, the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, it says when the ship, talking about ship here, was caught and could not face the wind, right? Which, by the way, again, is the word uh, pneuma, is the word for wind and spirit, same word. Uh, it gave way to us, and we're talking about real wind here that you can feel on your face when you're out on the sea. It gave way uh, to it. The ship did, gave way to it, right? They couldn't fight it, and they were, here's our word, driven along. Same word, same idea. Just like you know, might have a big ship that is being uh, pushed along by the wind, that's the idea. It goes where the wind wants to take it. 
And that's the idea of the prophets. They're writing down what the Spirit of God is directing them to write down. Uh, and then again in verse 17, talking about the sails here, and it says, um, the fearing, middle of verse 17, that they would run aground. It says they lowered the gear, and thus they were, again, the ship is going where the wind wants to take it. They were driven along. So these ideas communicated differently in our English text here in Acts 27 is the idea of the wind driving the ship in the direction it wants it to go. And that's what we're saying about the authors. As imperfect as the authors were, the product of what they provided us in the written scriptures was something provided to us by God's doing, by God's breathing out of that truth. And of course, the author is utilized like a ship to direct the writing of the text the way that God wants to produce it. Um, this is analogy. Peter Inns, uh, I adapted this from his illustration, but it's a good one. Uh, God sends the incarnate word, talking about Jesus Christ, right? Got a human parent, that's Mary. Holy Spirit, it says in the text, overshadows Mary. And what's the result? The result is Jesus Christ, who is without sin. It's a human being, right? 100% human in the sense that it's a uh, a, a derived from, a, from a, um, a mom, a human mom, in this case Mary, but we know that the Holy Spirit superintending of that birth and the way that the Spirit drove that, the reality of that conception and what comes out of that miraculously is Jesus Christ who is without sin. And that picture can be set right next to what we're claiming the Bible teaches, clearly it does, about the written word. And that is we have human authors like Moses, like Isaiah, like Malachi, like um, you name it, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, all these human authors. Uh, God sends his spirit here, picks these authors up, drives them along to produce a written word without error. It is exactly what God wanted down on paper. In the original manuscripts, that was the picture of God superintending this process. That leaves us with no other conclusion that, that what we're dealing with when we pick up the Bible is, as we dealt with yesterday, the, the, the authoritative Word of God. To reject it is to reject God's authoritative voice. And I thought I would put, at least in a visual depiction, a little bit of what I've been trying to say at least two or three times throughout this study in chapter 1. And that is that the Bible claims to be the product of God breathing out His truth utilizing the human authors to get that done. Claims to be the Word of God. Now, if it's false, all I'm saying, you got two options, either true or it's false. If it's intentionally false, right, if that's the case, well, then we're dealing with a book that just, it's, it's, a, it's a book of deception, a book of lies. If it's unintentional, these people really thought that they were being used by God to write these things, then it's a book of, of craziness, of nuttiness. Either way, I do not want to base my life, teach my children, uh, correct my own thinking based on a book that is a book of lies or a book of craziness. But if it is true, see, then it becomes the authoritative truth. And they wonder why we're quoting the Bible, whether the issue is, you know, sexual ethics or gender issues or morality of, of anything in life. We're sitting here quoting it and getting a lot of heat for it a lot of times in our modern day culture because we're quoting this old book. Well, this old book has the fingerprints of God all over it because of the predictive prophecies that are embedded in this book. And this is a reminder to us that we're dealing with the authoritative word of God, be, word of God, because of the prophetic nature of the book. And according to our text, that prophecy was not given by the will of man. It's not the origins of it, but these men spoke from God. And that word "from" is defined here in this next phrase as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's the doctrine of inspiration. We say the doctrine of the fact that the Bible is God's God's breathed word that he is giving his communication to mankind as though the breath of God is behind this, which is a, you know, a, a double meaning to that word, of course, breath, wind, and, and, and uh, spirit. God's spirit guides this process until it concludes with an authoritative book that we are confident is true because no other book is like it. And really, read any other holy book. Read the Polycanon, read, you know, the uh, Book of Mormon, read the... Um, uh, you know, the, the Quran, you can see these books are nothing like the scripture. Number one, a coherent history. I know the Book of Mormon claims to be, but look at the way the prophetic word is embedded into the scripture. 
about the future and how those things come true, unlike any other book, including the Book of Mormon or anything else that has predictive prophecies in it. Few would dare to have them, but when they do have them, they run the risk of either being true or false and clearly identified as true or false because of the fulfillment of those prophecies. So remember this great verse, good one to memorize. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's a good verse for us to contemplate and meditate on today. Tomorrow we'll be back as we get started on actually chapter two. After all these weeks, we're finally here in chapter two of Second Peter, and I'm enjoying our time together. Hope you are. Be sure to subscribe, comment. That's always an encouragement to me, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.